Greetings ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mengs and today it is time for a very special spotlight. This is the second time that I review a non-playable character from the Fire Emblem universe, the last one I did being Arvis. This character hails from the same game and personally I am very excited to do this one as she is one of my favorite villains to date. Today we are taking a look at the Goddess of Thunder, Ishtar. Ishtar is a noble of House Freech, one of the most influential families in Drugdral. She is the daughter of Bloom and Hilda, granddaughter of Reptor, the brother of Ishtar, the cousin of Arthur, Tinny, Amit and Linda, niece of Teltiu and the lover of Julius. Most importantly, however, she is the descendant of the Crusader Tordo and possesses major holy blood, allowing her to wield the sacred book of Mjolnir. Ishtar was born in Freej, which is one of the six dukedoms of Granvale. As a child, she was placed under the protection of General Reinhardt, who both looked after her and trained her in the art of thunder magic. Reinhardt acted as a big brother figure to Ishtar, but as she grew up to become a beautiful noblewoman, the Freej general started to develop feelings for her, though he kept them to himself. Life in the Freech family was not always pleasant. Hilda was a cruel woman who frequently abused Ishtar's niece, Tiltiu. Ishtar did what she could to soothe her niece's suffering, but she was powerless to stop it. After a while, the mishandling got so intense and horrid that Tiltiu became deeply depressed and eventually died. When she was still a young teenager, Ishtar met the son of Emperor Arvis, Julius, and the two fell in love. This greatly pleased Hilda, who saw this as a great opportunity to further the Freech family's influence and power in Granvel. Not long after the two teens had met, the Loptirian Archbishop Manfroy, head of the Lopto sect, bestowed the cursed tome of Loptir onto Julius, which possessed the young boy with the spirit of the Dark Dragon. This led Julius to kill his mother Deidre in an attempt to get rid of the Naga bloodline, but despite his demonic possession, he retained his feelings for Ishtar, and the two continued being lovers. With Julius's newfound demonic powers, the Lopterian Empire started to rise from the shadows and slowly take control over Granvale, turning Arvis into a puppet emperor, helpless to stop their horrific acts. Julius and Manfroy started instigating terrible child hunts to gather new servants for their empire. Ishtar confronted Julius about this and pleaded him to stop, but he refused to listen, so instead, she secretly started working together with Arvis to save as many children as they could. Some time after the child hunt started, Julius suddenly came down with a high fever that threatened to end his life. In order to help him, Ishtar travelled to Leinster to seek the aid of Bishop Sias, the illegitimate son of Arvis. During this time, Julius noticed how close Reinhardt was to Ishtar, also sensing his feelings for her, which drove him into a jealous rage. He demanded that Ishtar dismiss Reinhardt from her service and even wanted to kill him merely for the way he was looking at her, though Ishtar eventually managed to talk him out of it. When the newly led Liberation Army, led by Prince Selif, reached the Yi Desert, they marched on Melgan Castle, where Ishtar's brother, Ishtor, was stationed, and during the siege of the castle, Ishtor was killed in battle. They then proceeded to march on Manster Castle, where they joined up with Leif's army, and together they drove out Ishtar's father, Bloom, forcing him to retreat to his eastern castle in northern Tracia. As the combined forces of Selif and Leif marched into northern Tracia, Ishtar would clash with the Liberation Army for the first time. After convincing her father to lend her the Holy Tome of Mjolnir, she set out on her own to confront them in battle, but she was defeated and greatly wounded in the process. However, before she could die, Julius used his shamanistic power to teleport himself onto the battlefield and rescued her. Ishtar's second confrontation with the Liberation Army came at Miletos Castle. After attempting to get Emperor Arvis to free some captured children, Julius suddenly appeared to inform her that the Liberation Army was approaching and that he wanted to play a game with her, seeing which one of them could kill a soldier of the army first. Ishtar agreed and met the Liberation Army in battle alongside her lover, though despite their little game, the two of them were eventually forced to retreat. Ishtar's third and final confrontation with the Liberation Army occurred during the final Holy War. After her mother Hilda was slain in the war, Ishtar urged Julius to let her lead the last vestiges of House Freej out into the battlefield to take vengeance on Selef and the rest of the Liberation Army. While Julius was initially a bit mistrustful of Ishtar as he was starting to doubt her loyalty, his narcissistic attitude of believing he was invincible led him to accept her requests. And so, Ishtar set out to confront the Crusaders for the last time. 
Ishtar has a very complex personality, but since she is not directly playable, we have no supports or expanded backstory to look into, which means that we can only go by what we see in the game. There are three things about Ishtar that we can almost be certain about. One, she is not evil. Two, she is extremely loyal to her family. And three, she absolutely loves Julius. This is obviously quite conflicting for her, seeing as she is in a relationship with an evil possessed prince, and that her family is currently serving a ruthless, tyrannical empire that hunts children and kills its own citizens, so this must obviously be quite difficult for Ishtar. Despite growing up in a very dysfunctional family and watching her niece undergo terrible abuse on a daily basis, Ishtar grew up to be a kind and caring individual. She comforted Tiltyu and tried her best to save as many children as possible from the grasp of the Lopturian priests, despite knowing full well that this would greatly anger Julius had he found out about it. In contrast to her kindness, however, Ishtar is shown to be a very fierce woman with an electric temper. She is greatly angered by the death of her family members and wants to take vengeance upon the Liberation Army, even though she knows that they are just fighting an oppressive evil empire. Why Ishtar never considers betraying Julius and joining the Crusaders is quite perplexing, but it's clear that her loyalty to her family and to Julius runs deeper than her own moral values. There are two things about Ishtar that are rather questionable in regards to her behavior. The first is when she seeks out Bishop Sias to help him cure Julius of his illness. Despite being fully aware of the evil child hunts her lover partakes in, she still makes an attempt to save his life, even though Drugdral would clearly be better off without him. She could have done nothing and just left him to die, and many children would probably be spared as a result, but no, she just has to save him. The second is when she learns of her mother's death, and thus sets out to take vengeance on the Liberation Army. It is very questionable why she would mourn the loss of Hilda, knowing what an evil, vile, abusive person she was. But it could also be theorized that at this point, Ishtar had lost the last remaining member of her family, and was probably in despair. Ishtar's final actions during the Holy War have led many people to question her motives. Even Julius suspects something is wrong when she requests his permission to lead her last remaining soldiers into battle. Many wonder if this was Ishtar willingly committing suicide, seeing as her house was all but destroyed and she realized Julius had no future as Emperor of Granville. Others believe that she was truly angry and wanted vengeance upon the Liberation Army for killing her family. In her final battle quote, she does seem to have a lot of anger in her words, so the latter explanation could be feasible. Sadly, there is no way to completely understand what went through Ishtar's mind during her final moments. She is clearly meant to be a perplexing, mysterious character, and that's what makes her so intriguing, but it's clear that she is a very conflicted individual who is torn between loyalty to her family and her moral compass. Ishtar is the only boss in Genealogy of the Holy War that is fought three times. Ishtar has the highest skill of any character in the game at 47. Despite being a minor descendant of Fala, Ishtar possesses no Fala holy blood. Ishtar's name comes from the Assyrian and Babylonian goddess of fertility, love and war. The three Falconites in Ishtar's Awakening Spot Pass team represents Meng, Bleg and Maybell. After setting out to lead the last remnants of her house in a final clash with the Liberation Army, Ishtar is defeated for the third time, and this time for good. As she dies on the battlefield, the last words on her lips are, Lord Julius. Shortly after her death, Julius is also slain, and the last vestiges of the Lopterian Empire are finally snuffed out, ending the final holy war. The Frege family does not end with Ishtar, however, as a few family members were present in the Liberation Army, and if they survive the battle, they will continue ruling the house in her stead. Since Ishtar is a boss character and not playable, this segment will be used to describe her three encounters in the game, and how to best deal with her. Let's talk about her first appearance in Chapter 8, where she will show up on Turn 5 outside Konata Castle. After getting the meal near tome from her father, she will start moving towards your army. If you don't want to fight her, just stay clear of her for 7 turns, and Julius will eventually warp in to take her away. Though if you do this, it's going to be very hard for you to reach the northmost village in time to get the power ring. 
If you want to fight Ishtar in Chapter 8, it's best to simply not let her attack you at all. She hits incredibly hard with the Mjolnir Tome, doing 60 magic damage, and thanks to her Adept skill, which has a 49% chance of activating, she can easily take down any of your units in a single round of combat. Also be wary of her Vantage skill. If you bring her to 20 hit points or below, she will always attack first, making things very difficult for you. Thankfully, Ishtar is extremely frail. Due to her 42 hit points and 10 defense, it is possible to kill her before she gets a chance to counterattack. Shanan with the Balmung proking Astra, Faval with the Yufel or Arthur if you pass down Forseti to him can all pull this off. Though keep in mind that Ishtar has an ungodly high avoid of 70%, so utilize your own charisma units and Celeb's leadership stars to counter this as much as possible. And make sure you don't let Ishtar take cover on a forest or village tile, as that will make her almost unhittable. Ishtar's second encounter will take place towards the end of Chapter 10, where she will show up alongside Julius outside Mileto's castle. There are four ways to deal with this encounter. The first alternative is to sacrifice one of your playable characters, as Julius and Ishtar will both teleport away when one of them kills a unit. If you pass down the Valkyrie staff from Generation 1, this might be the easiest alternative for newer players, as it will only cost you 30,000 gold. Or, if you're stingy with your money, you can always sacrifice a shit unit like Hannibal. The second alternative is killing Julius, and this is almost impossible at this point during the game. You can't even silence him as he has 35 resistance thanks to his Loptir Tome, but he can be taken down in combat if you manage to score several critical hits in a row on a unit like Aris or maybe a Swordmaster with Astra wielding a hero sword with 99 kills on it, though this is unreliable and requires a lot of luck or RNG manipulation. You don't get anything out of it either unless you did not pass down the Leg Ring from the first generation, in which case Julius will drop this if defeated. The third option is defeating Ishtar. While she has 7 more hit points in this encounter, her defense is still 10, and your units have most likely gotten considerably stronger since Chapter 8. The difficult part is getting to her. Julius has a leg ring in this encounter, which allows him to attack every single tile that Ishtar can reach, and there are almost no units in your army that can take the combined firepower of the Loptir and Mjolnir Tome and survive. Furthermore, Julius has 5 leadership stars, which will increase Ishtar's already sky-high hit and avoid by 40%, making her pretty much impossible to hit while she's next to him. You can solve this in two ways. You can either lure Julius to the southwest, away from Ishtar, or you can hope that the AI will have Ishtar moving to attack first, so if you position a unit capable of retaliating and killing her in a single round of combat, like Faval with the Ufel, or Sed, Arthur, or Charlo with the Forseti, they can hopefully kill her on the retaliation strike and make her teleport away before Julius can come in to assist her. Silencing Ishtar is also a pretty safe alternative to fighting her. In Chapter 10 she comes equipped with a Barrier Ring which sets her total resistance to 31, but this can be overcome if you have any unit on your team with 27 magic or more wielding the Magic Ring, which can conveniently be obtained in the same chapter from the southwestern village. Units like Sed or even his substitute Hawk should be capable of doing this. If you can silence Ishtar, taking her down should be pretty easy. There is a fourth and much more lucrative alternative to all this, however. If you are good at utilizing your dancer and maybe a rescue staff, you can merely dart past Julius and Ishtar, kill the Dark Bishop guarding the castle behind them, and if you can then get Seleph in range to seize the castle, Julius and Ishtar will both teleport away as if you had defeated them. Ishtar's third and last encounter will happen towards the end of the final chapter, where she will come out of Bahala Castle leading a very large force of units towards you. You won't just have to deal with Ishtar here, but also her minions, and three very strong Falcon Knight mini-bosses. Not only that, but Ishtar herself has gotten considerably beefier, now at 70 hit points and 18 defense, making her a lot harder to simply one-shot with a holy weapon. But in return, you should now have a wide array of holy weapons to deal with her. Seleph with his tear thing is pretty much designed to fight powerful magic users, and can even survive two consecutive Mjolnir hits if he is properly leveled up, though he might struggle to hit her with her insane avoidance, which is even more crazy now since she's sporting five leadership stars. A promoted Aris with the Mistleton is also really good against her too, as his insane skill boosts will counteract her insane avoidance. Shannon with the Balmung should still be pretty effective against her, as well as Faval with the Ufel. Any Forseti user will also have a big advantage against her with her weapon triangle disadvantage, especially if you stack other bonuses such as Charisma units, leadership stars, lover bonuses, and defensive terrain. If all else fails, the silent staff is still as effective as ever, so if you have a staff user with 28 magic or more wielding a magic ring, you can completely shut her down, completely trivializing the fight. 
Overall, Ishtar is one of the more threatening enemies you will face in the second generation of Genealogy of the Holy War. While she is completely shut down by a silent staff, she can be an absolute terror for newer players who don't know how to adequately deal with her. Just be careful not to anger the Goddess of Thunder too much, and perhaps you'll live to see another day. Genealogy of the Holy War arguably brought us some of the best villains in the series, and Ishtar is definitely up there as one of the more memorable ones for me. In a franchise filled with black and white characters who are seemingly either purely evil or purely good, it is very refreshing to get a character that is actually torn between good and evil. Ishtar is a perplexing character that has intrigued fans of Fire Emblem for years, and will probably continue to do so for as long as people replay this game, and if an eventual remake of the game comes out, we can only hope that this trend continues. Needless to say, I absolutely love Ishtar. She really embodies what I love so much about Genealogy of the Holy War, an excellently written villain that hits pretty much every mark perfectly for me. 5 out of 5 stars. Not only is Ishtar a fantastically well-written character, but her design is equally impressive. To this day, I think Ishtar easily manages to stand out as one of the more memorable characters in the series. She is the perfect combination of strong and beautiful. She shows just enough skin to be sexy, but at the same time, her clothes are modest enough to not put her into the category of a fanservice character. I particularly love her black dress with the thunderbolts on it, alongside her shoulder pads and black cape, which contrasts beautifully with her lilac hair, pale skin and tall white boots. Her appearance is foreboding and intimidating, while also reflecting her inner sadness and conflict. I don't know how it can get any better than this. 5 out of 5 stars. Since Ishtar is not playable, rating her utility is not possible, so instead her utility will be replaced by a difficulty rating, representing how much of a challenge she imposes on the player. While Fire Emblem 4 is not known for its high difficulty, you do face some terrifying enemies in the second generation that poses a threat even towards your major Holy Blood characters, and Ishtar is definitely one of these. She is fought three times in total, more than any other boss character in the game, and while the two first fights aren't particularly difficult, her third encounter is downright terrifying if you don't have a unit capable of silencing her. Sure, she has her weak points, but so does every other boss in Fire Emblem 4, so as far as a challenge goes, it's not feasible for me to rate her at anything lower than a 5 out of 5 star rating, making Ishtar the first perfectly ranked character in my Spotlight series. Thank you so much for watching this Fire Emblem Character Spotlight. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, consider helping out this video with a like and let me know what character you want to see me feature in a future spotlight by leaving a comment below. I would like to give a big shout out to Noe Green, who requested this spotlight of Ishtar alongside this drawing as her silver tier Patreon reward. Thank you so much for everything you do to support the channel, Noe. I hope you enjoyed the video. Before we end this video, I want to give a massive shout out to my amazing Patreon supporters. You guys are the best and I really appreciate each and every one of you. You make it possible for me to produce all this Fire Emblem content for you all on a daily basis, especially now that YouTube is demonetizing videos left, right and center for seemingly no reason at all. If you become a Patreon supporter today, you get instant access to my Patreon-only Discord chat, the ability to participate in Patreon hangouts and ask questions for my Patreon Q&A videos. Also, if you become a silver tier Patreon, you can request your very own Fire Emblem character spotlight, alongside a drawing of your favorite Fire Emblem character done personally by my designer. You can check out her Instagram or Facebook page by clicking the link in the video description to see some of the work she's done previously. She is extremely talented. Also, my two script readers, Sonagi and Heliasan, help me with the fine-tuning of the script of the spotlight, along with Mecha, who also assists with correcting errors and mistakes. Anyway, that's all for now. If you want to see more spotlights, check out the playlist linked in front of you. There's also another direct link which will take you to the previous spotlight I did. Anyway, my name is Winmangs, thank you for watching all the way to the end, you are a true fan. Don't forget to leave that like, and I will see you guys next time. Goodbye.